But it's, it's my pleasure to introduce John Hunter, who's going to talk to us about esophageal perforations. Well, this is a, indeed a somewhat intimidating crowd, and to get up here and to confess all your sins in front of it is a little worse than an M&M as a chief resident, I can tell you. But, uh, you know, I was kind of sitting out there thinking, uh, you know, if we got, we've had a heavy dose of Ohio State and now we got Oregon. I was thinking, you know, what, what is the, what's the common denominator here? And I c couldn't decide whether it was Kevin Revis or Kyle Perry, but somehow it did. it's one of the two of them. I'm sure they're in the audience, but no, no seriously, I think the, re the real reason why uh, Jeff has uh, been asked to, to uh, lead this is that uh, Ohio State has a long tradition of, of talking about their complications and, and sharing them. I, I was once told by a leading professor of surgery and chair that, that you don't talk about your complications. But the so icon of Ohio State was Bob Zollinger. And uh, I think many of you know the story that when uh, Bob Zollinger cut a common bile duct, the last thing he wanted to do was have uh, people talking about it. So he went from room to room in the, every operating room at the Ohio State uh, uh, Hospital and said, Zollinger cut the common bile duct. And then went to the next room and said, Zollinger cut the common bile duct. <laughs> went around to ev every room. So. So I, I'm going to stand up here in front of you and tell you that I perforated the esophagus. And uh, <laughs> actually, what you'll see is I actually perforated it twice. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, so, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I, was, I ran into Larissa Coleman, who was our fellow last year outside, and I said, you know, the, the, a lot of my video is really old video because you know, I haven't done this much in the last uh, couple of, well, last 10 years since we've had good video and certainly in the last two years since we've had HD. And Larissa said, well, what about that lap heller we did last year? And what, so I said, well, I don't have videos of those. But so <laughs> anyway, some of my video is a little bit old here, but I did uh, scrounge around. I, I sent out uh, emails as that we all have to our friends and none of them admitted to, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, perforating the esophagus. So I had to go back to some old video footage I had. So I'm going to really talk about two mechanisms of uh, gastroesophageal perforation. Um, the uh, first is the dreaded bougie. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about cervical, about intrathoracic and intra-abdominal. Um, and then direct in surgical injury. And uh, so this is the, uh, the first uh, uh, series of video. Uh, you can feel the, the, the dilator there. It's in perfect pos position to do the lap and and you pull back and oh, Jesus, what is that? <laughs> and uh, so, so that's kind of a dreaded sight. And pulling back the data doesn't really fix the problem much. Um, so just, just to, there, there it is again. Uh, this is not, this is actually, I just wanted to make sure you didn't miss it the first time. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I, I got it on here a third time, but I won't show it to you a third time. We'll, 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 we'll just go ahead on. Um, and uh, so you know, why does this happen? Um, the, the, uh, most of us close the hiatus posteriorly. I think you should close the hiatus posteriorly when you do a, a, a lap nissen. You need to uh, elevate the esophagus up off the aorta um, so that you have a gentle arc uh, of the esophagus anteriorly and not a sharp uh, deflection at the level of the crua. If you have a sharp deflection, you're at risk um, of uh, a perforation at two places. This posteriorly in the uh, posterior mediastinum as the esophagus takes its anterior deflection is one spot, but the video you just saw is where it mo more commonly perforates as the uh, GE junction uh, is angled uh, posteriorly, especially if a Penrose drain is around the esophagus. So this is uh, probably the most common um, uh, place that uh, perforations occur. Um, so the principles of avoidance, I think I want to talk both about this and repair. Um, the uh, first is um, dissect, dissection. Um, so you'll see some of the direct perforations. Uh, they occur because the surgeon didn't dissect out the crura. They went to dissect the esophagus. A dissection of, and a Nissen fundal application is a dissection of the crura. Now, when you pass dilators, um, everybody has their own way. There, there are um, some people use balloons. The problem with the balloons is the risk of catching them with a suture uh, and having a video similar to what we just saw Brad show. Uh, but, uh, so I don't like balloons. Um, we had a, a number of, uh, when I was at Emory, had a couple of perforations in the cervical region because we started with a, a large stiff dilator which uh, perforated just above the cricopharyngeus. Um, and so at that point we started using uh, small dilators first just to make sure you have a clear passage. 
And when you don't, or if you have a, a, a miscommunication, usually the smaller ones will, will curl or will curl back before they perforate. So we actually passed two dilators, and that, since we've done that, we haven't had a dilator-related perforation. So, um, so the, we use, first use a, a 40, and then the large dilator, which is either a 56 or a, or a, a 60. And in all cases, you know, this crew resource management and communication is incredibly important for dilator passage. Uh, you have to ask the uh, anesthesiologist uh, or nurse anesthetist or whoever's at the head of the table to, uh, to tell you how far in the dilator is from the incisors. Now, any of you who use Maloney's realize there's both European and American lengths uh, on the Maloney. Uh, the uh, American lengths from the tip, the European from the widest part of the, of the dilator. So uh, whatever your convention is, stick with it. Uh, we tend to use the American uh, measures, which are in the... Um, and, uh, and so all that has to be communicated and then communicated back across the ether screen so you make sure they understand uh, how far in the dilator is. Um, clearly, it just has to slide in really easily if there's any resistance. And I, I have a very low tolerance for scrubbing out and passing the dilator myself or having one of our fellows pass the dilator. Uh, it's, it's, well, it's uh, time well spent uh, um, rather than, uh, and especially if someone at the head of the table is inexperienced. Um, and then what the, the, the error that you just saw in that last one was that the, the camera was, uh, the laparoscope was in at the esophagus, wasn't uh, viewing the whole uh, field. Uh, so you need to follow the dilator tip through the GE junction into the stomach by backing off uh, the camera. Now you've got to ask the question, what about not using a dilator at all? Um, and there are people, I'm sure, in this room, probably many people in this room that don't use a dilator. I'm not going to take a poll because I, 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 uh, I'm afraid how many people would raise their hands. But I, I, I've done th many thousands of Nissans and I still use a dilator. Um, Lee uh, and Swanson and Paul Hansen did a very nice randomized trial in which they randomized patients to dilator and no dilator. And it was clear that those were the, that in which a dilator was used uh, had lower rates of dysphagia. So we do have level one data to show that a dilator does make a difference. Um, so I think it is uh, valuable and, and the, for the last thousand or more of these operations, we've had no perforations using the strategy uh, that you see here. That's just a picture of sort of the overview that you should see. Rel the other thing that I haven't said that I think is important is just release tension on the drain so that we re release the drain entirely uh, as we pass the dilator, uh, and that uh, helps avoid that deflection or, uh, that's caused by the uh, drain around the esophagus. So um, the uh, cervical perforation um, is a is a little bit more difficult. Uh, direct repair uh, is hard. It's often posterior to the, uh, uh, at the level of, of the cricopharyngeus and probably not necessary. Um, the, the cervical perforations we've had, we've uh, drained, um, one through a cervical incision um, and the other with an NG tube uh, through the perforation uh, itself. The NG tube passed into the perforation. We just backed it out slowly as the perforation closed. Uh, so again, that, that's another way to do it. Uh, antibiotics, of course, broad spectrum antibiotics until the fistula is healed uh, is very important. Now what about the use of a stent? Uh, certainly lots of literature about the more rapid closure of, of esophago or esophago cutaneous fistulas when a stent is used. Uh, stents uh, have a high migration rate, especially high in the esophagus, so they're really not that useful in the cervical region. So we haven't uh, used stents in this location. Uh, and again, follow up with a water-soluble esophagram. That's your proof that your, your uh, fistula is healed and it's okay to start using the esophagus again. Now, here's, a, here's another uh, perforation. This is a, you can see the video quality isn't that great. It's an older video. It's a posterior gastric perforation. The surgeon thinks he's dissecting behind the stomach, but you can see he's a little low down here. This is out clearly the stomach and then recognizes that indeed there's a gastric mucosa. So the problem with this, of course, is that, that they are not on the crura, and the crura now is appearing down, down here. Um, and once they uh, find that, they've done a repair uh, with, um, and uh, finally get around behind. But we're not going to talk about uh, pneumothorax here, so let's, let's go on to this thing will advance. Okay, so here's another case. This is kind of an interesting case. Here's a um, case where there's a large uh, lyomyoma uh, right at the uh, GE junction. Um, 
And in fact, the interesting thing was patient also had reflux disease and had an erosion right over the top of this thing, um, and it was bleeding as leiomyomas tend to do. Uh, so this was the, the largest portion of the leiomyoma, uh, which is being removed uh, right here. And then uh, once this was pulled out, um, it became clear there's another little bit that had been left behind. So a, a, a stitch is put in that. You can see that they're in the submucosal region uh, just as a stay stitch. Um, and uh, you can see that was an old video because we're using a ski needle, and that kind of clearly dates it to the early 90s sometime. Um, and uh, so well, it just go, goes on a little slow, so I try to tell jokes that it goes. Now, um, and uh, so here we're kind of dissecting around it. Um, and you know, in, in the course of doing so, there were a, a few uh, little um, cutaneous bleeders. You can see one here and a lot of some irrigation. Every, every time we, you know, we irrigated, the anesthesiologist said the patient's temperature was dropping significantly. Um, and uh, that was quite puzzling to me at the time. I couldn't figure out why that was. Um, and uh, I think you're going to see that we discover the, the culprit here in just a minute that and in fact, the uh, last uh, leiomyoma here was indeed the uh, esophageal temp probe. So that lesson about uh, removing everything from the mouth except the endotracheal tube is a very valuable one because, of course, we thought about the NG tube and had them remove the NG tube, but uh, I did not think about the esophageal uh, temp probe at that point. So there it is uh, sticking out. And this, uh, as you can see, you've got a nice view of the mucosa. Uh, <laughs> Right here, nice view of the lumen of the esophagus. Um, and I uh, want to make sure we had this on videotape. Uh, and uh, a, the muscularis. So uh, the, I'm not going to uh, make you watch this whole uh, exercise in suturing, but it was just a simple uh, two layer closure uh, first of the mucosa um, with a running suture, vicral suture, and then um, interrupted sutures of the uh, serosa with, uh, with silk. So we'll move on from this and get to the end of it. Now, one of the things I find very valuable, um, even when I don't think I've perforated, is the use of methylene blue. Uh, this was a patient, this is actually a more recent case. This was a, a redo uh, fund application, maybe even a three or a four do, I can't remember. Uh, but uh, we didn't really think we'd uh, done anything bad uh, at all and tested at the end of it. You can see the esophagus kind of looks like dog meat. And in fact, once we put some methylene blue in, you can actually recognize that this is a lip of mucosa. And uh, the, the stitch had been uh, uh, placed at this level and had pulled out as the Nissen slipped. So this place, this was actually up in the mediastinum. And uh, the Nissen that we took down was down here. So we really didn't even expect any uh, hole higher up. But in fact, there it was. And we were able to close it with suture. So methylene blue is really valuable. So principles of repair, I like two layers, hand sewn. Um, one layer probably is OK. I never get in debates with people, two layer versus one layer, because I know there's no data. Um, the staple closure is, is really, okay, is, is when possible, is good and fast and OK. Um, I like to test the. Uh, uh, repair interoperatively uh, with either gastroscopy or with uh, dilute methylene blue via an NG tube. And I usually test before discharge as well. I know the, the bariatric surgeons don't feel this uh, water soluble contrast is very valuable, but we do this uh, fairly routinely. So I'm going to stop there and uh, thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. There's no, no tweets. Uh, actually, here comes one. I think we're starting to see a common theme, and uh, uh, the esophageal temperature probe is really kind of kind of becoming the enemy. Uh, do you ever close the esophagus over a T-tube? Oh, um, you know, I, I have done that. Um, I've d done it in the context of a, uh, a dead conduit uh, in an esophageal gastrectomy. Uh, so through the chest, put, put a T-tube in, uh, and that way preserve the conduit. So yeah, that is a, a reason, very reasonable way to close it. You don't need to do that on these acute perforations because you can just sew them up. Um, but on a delayed perforation with sepsis, uh, drainage is more appropriate. Any other questions from the audience? If not, you let me. I thought you were going to let me off easy. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, 
It's a good question. I think most of the perforations, again, we haven't seen one for you know, 15 years or so, but they, they were both, the, the ones that I talked about were both above the cricopharyngea. So I, I think that you'd feel like someone put a clip in the back of your throat. Um, and and, and probably, probably not at that level, but lower down, below the cricopharyngea, absolutely. I don't, wouldn't see any reason why you might not want to do that. Another question. Uh, do you ever use any to seal or anything on there? I know there's no data, but a lot of surgeons seem to like to put that on there to make them feel better. Or, or do you feel there's any advantage to that if you close a per acute perforation and put some of that stuff on there? Yeah. You know, I, I think if it's clean and the tissue's viable, I mean, it, to me, it's just like doing an anastomosis. I, I don't put tissue seal on all my anastomoses, so I don't feel I need to do it. If the tissue's, you know, at risk, yeah, I probably might, I might put some tissue seal, but I don't use very much of it. You ever, the reasons you, you ever try and swing some momentum up there at all? Or? Again, it, it, with a, where I felt that there was, there was a, a security issue buttressing it with the momentum or you know, intercostal flap or just anything you could find. I've used hernia sac. I've used all sorts of stuff to buttress when, when there's a, a concern about viability or, the, of the, or, or uh, integrity of the repair. But the ones I showed you, I just didn't feel that that was necessary. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thanks for this uh, presentation. Uh, about uh, suturing the esophagus, you, you, you said that you can do one, one layer or two layers. Yes, I, I okay. usually... Okay. You prefer one and covered by the stomach or two layers. It may mm, make some ischemia and may perforate again or fistulate. I, so I'm not sure I heard, you, understood you, what you prefer to do one layer or, or two, two layers. I got that or part. one layer and covered by the stomach. Oh, yeah, I, I, I've got that part. Yeah, no, uh, the esophagus is, you know, as anyone who does um, hellermyotomy or poem or whatever, realizes that the mucosa and the muscularis are so very distinct on the esophagus that it's, it's actually quite easy to do a two-layer repair and I think more mm -hmm. secure. If we're doing a diverticulectomy, we'll staple the diverticulum off and then close the muscle over the staple line. So, so I think a double, so two-layer repair uh, and then, you know, certainly buttress it with a fundo if you're going to, but I don't think you, you necessarily have to if you've done a nice two-layer repair. Thank you. I love your presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you have a perforation that is proximal to your expected place for the fund application, do you go ahead and do the fund application after repairing? Yes, I would, absolutely. I would not stop what I intended and I'm, I'm going to do one last tweet, and then we'll, we're going to move on. Um, every time you have to repair a perforation, uh, do you drain it? No, oh, absolutely not. I mean, you can't drain the uh, uh, peritoneal cavity. Um, I know people put, uh, and I probably, when I used to do pancreatic surgery, put drains near the pancreas, but that was about the only place I'd put a drain that, uh, uh, no, I don't, I don't put drains in when I just made a hole and closed it. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. One right. more. Yeah. Uh, feeding jejunostomy or NJ tube. Uh, again, you know, high risk anastomosis, we do it in esophagectomy, uh, but I, I wouldn't do it for just a, a hole like you've seen here that I've made. I don't think that's necessary because I, I would uh, usually just keep them NPO for you know, three or four days, put them on a liquid diet, and if they're well nourished to start with, that's not a problem. But thank you. Thank you, John.